Aladdin and the Magic Lamp Many many years ago in a small town in Persia a little boy Aladdin lived with his mother they were very poor his mother used to do small little chores for the rich nawabs and earn some money with that money she used to feed herself and her little son Aladdin had never gone to school. One day, as Aladdin was playing in the street with his friends, a tall, well-dressed man approached him. "You must be Aladdin, my brother's son. I have come all the way from Africa to meet your mother and you." Saying this, he forcefully picked up the little boy and kissed him on his forehead. Aladdin was totally surprised. He didn't know what to do. Seeing the boy's reluctance, the stranger pressed some money into his palm. Aladdin was happy. He took the stranger to his house. The man introduced himself to Aladdin's mother and gave her some money too. He chatted with them for some time and then left. He promised to return the next morning and take Aladdin out for the whole day. The little boy had never ventured too far away from his house. He was excited and apprehensive at the same time. The next morning, as promised, the stranger came and took Aladdin out. They went out of the town, crossing many fields and rivers and forests. Then they reached a mountain. By now, Aladdin was fully at ease with the strange man. He asked the little boy to collect some sticks. Then he made a fire. He said some magic words, and the earth opened up before them, showing many stairs leading downwards. Aladdin was very scared. He tried to run away. The man caught hold of him roughly and threatened him with severe punishment if he tried to escape. The little boy was trembling with fear. The man snarled, "I am no uncle of yours. I am a magician from Africa. You must go down to the bottom of the stairs and fetch me an old lamp which is there." Giving him a ring from his finger, he said, "Take this ring with you." it will keep danger away don't be afraid aladdin had no choice he climbed down the steps and when he reached the bottom of the stairs all his fears vanished there was a beautiful garden with lots of fruit trees he was wonderstruck as he came closer he realized that instead of fruits There were rubies and sapphires and emeralds hanging from the trees. He filled his pockets with these gems, picked up the lamp and hurried up the stairs. The man was getting impatient. He yelled at Aladdin to hurry. As soon as the little boy reached the top, the magician blocked half the opening with a huge rock. He refused to help Aladdin up. and only asked for the lamp the little boy refused the magician got angry and pushed the rock over the opening thus removing all chances of his escape aladdin began to cry he just wanted to be with his mother by mistake he rubbed the ring the magician had given him and to his utter surprise a great big genie appeared out of a ring of smoke the genie gently said i am the slave of all who wear the ring what is your wish little master take me to my mother's house said aladdin hardly believing his eyes and ears and sure enough the genie carried him back to his house rub the ring whenever you need me my master saying this The genie disappeared. Aladdin narrated the day's events to his mother and showed her the lamp. 
It looks so old and dirty. Now why would the magician want this lamp? She wondered aloud as she began to wipe the dirt from it. Soon, a huge genie appeared in a cloud of smoke and said, I am the slave of the lamp. What is your wish, mistress? Aladdin's mother was so baffled, she didn't know what to do. Aladdin was used to all this by now. He calmly asked the genie for food. At once, their tiny room was filled with delicious food. The little boy and his mother ate to their heart's content. Life went on happily for the two of them. Whenever they needed something, they rubbed the magic lamp and their wish was fulfilled instantly. One day, Aladdin happened to see a Sultan's daughter riding by their street and he fell head over heels in love with her. Aladdin's mother had kept the jewels he had brought from the mountain safely. The next day, she took those jewels and visited the Sultan's palace. He was so impressed that he decided to wed his daughter to Aladdin. He promised to meet Aladdin at his palace. Once again, Aladdin and his mother took the help of the genie of the lamp and got a beautiful palace for themselves. Soon, the princess and Aladdin became man and wife. The magician from Africa was seeing what was happening. He was very jealous of Aladdin and wanted to get hold of the lamp at any cost. Disguised as a lamp merchant, he came to their palace when he knew Aladdin and his mother wouldn't be there. The princess was not aware of the magic lamp. She willingly exchanged it with a new one. The magician was quick to act. The moment he got the magic lamp, he rubbed it and asked the genie to transport him, the princess and Aladdin's palace to Africa. When Aladdin returned, he realized what must have happened. He rubbed the ring and asked the genie of the ring to take him to his wife in Africa. Once reunited with her, he quietly crept into the room where the magician was sleeping. The magic lamp was protruding from his robe. He pulled it and rubbed it hard. Then he requested the genie of the lamp to get rid of the magician and to transport him, his wife and their palace back to Persia. Thereafter, Aladdin used the magic lamp to help the poor people and he lived happily ever after with his beautiful princess. Mirror, mirror on the wall. King Rudolph, the ruler of Simada, a small island off the east coast of Africa, was very handsome. He was tall and dark with broad shoulders. He sported thick black curly hair and had sparkling blue eyes. His eyes were always twinkling with laughter. Each time he smiled, his pearl-white teeth would add to his charm. King Rudolph ruled Simada well and his subjects loved him. He would personally go to meet his people, address their problems, participate in their joys and sorrows. The entire island city of Simada was like one big family. Now, King Rudolph had a very big mirror in his room. Although he was not vain, he would often stand in front of it and admire his reflection. He obviously liked 
what he saw as he would flash his charming smile and the entire room would light up with its radiance. When and how King Rudolph became lazy, nobody knew. He soon stopped his horse riding and hunting trips. He would not even walk in the palace gardens. He would have his breakfast in bed, then turn over and take another nap till noon. Then he would have his lunch, do a little work sitting on his throne, have dinner and again go to sleep. And all his meals were king size. He had become so immersed in himself that he even forgot to look into his favorite mirror. Many months passed. One day, he caught his reflection in the mirror just by accident. He stared and stared at what he saw. He was horrified. In place of the slim, trim, handsome Rudolph, a fat, ugly man with puffy eyes, mottled skin and a rounded tummy stared back at him. Who's this stranger? What's happened to my mirror? Where is Rudolph? Where is the handsome me? Questions were racing in his head. He called his attendant and asked him to replace the mirror immediately. Soon the king forgot about the mirror. He ate a heavy lunch and went to sleep. In the evening, he went for a ride in his carriage, but he hardly saw anyone or anything on the way. He kept on yawning. The next morning, he finished his breakfast and hurried to see himself in the new mirror. What was this? The same image? A fat, ugly man stared back at him. He was very angry. He shouted at his attendant and ordered him to once again replace the mirror. It had better be good, he warned, or I will put you in prison. The next morning, he quickly gulped his breakfast and rushed to check the new mirror. A lovely new mirror was hanging on the wall. It was covered by a lace curtain. He eagerly lifted the lace curtain and stepped back. He screamed in anger. The same fat, ugly man looked back at him. His most trusted counsellor and his best friend Becca was waiting. He knew the king would be angry when he sees his reflection in the mirror. What is the matter, your majesty? Becca, is that me? No, your majesty. Then what's wrong with all the mirrors in the palace? Asked Rudolph angrily. All the mirrors are faulty, your majesty. Please come with me. He took hold of the king and led him to the highest turret of the palace. Pointing to the hills at a distance, he said, Your Majesty, somewhere in the hills, the mirror of truth lies hidden. Anyone who wishes to see himself as he really is, has to seek the magic mirror, and on finding it, he may learn the truth. The king was encouraged. Thank you, Becca. I will leave immediately after breakfast tomorrow in my carriage to look for it. No, Your Majesty. The person has to seek it on foot. Also, the mirror remains visible only for one hour after dawn. The rest of the day, it remains invisible. The king sighed. Then so be it. I will get up before dawn and walk to the hills to seek the mirror of truth. The next morning, he woke up well before dawn and hurried to the hills on foot. 
he was not used to walking. He soon started panting. Huffing and puffing, he reached the hill. He looked around but could not find the mirror. As the sun began to rise, he started his return journey. He felt sad. His friend Becca was waiting for him outside the palace gates. Do not lose heart, he told the king. You will find it if you search hard. You must keep trying. You will surely succeed. And thus started the king's journey. Every morning, he would wake up before dawn and start his journey on foot. After a few days, he started enjoying the walk as the air was cool and fresh at that time. Instead of returning to the palace, tired and irritated, he would return happy and fresh. Six months passed. Then one day, Pekka told the king, Your Majesty, I had a dream last night where I saw the magic mirror. I think I might be able to find it. I will accompany you tomorrow morning. Very well, said King Rudolph. And the next morning, the king and Becca set off towards the hills. Becca found it tough to match the swift stride of the king. They reached the foothills when it was still dark. Becca asked the king to wait while he went to the spot he had dreamt of. He entered some bushes. A few minutes later, he came out smiling and told the king, Your Majesty, I found it. The mirror of truth is finally there. Why don't you take a look and see it for yourself? The king was trembling with excitement. He stood in front of the mirror shut his eyes for a moment and then looked at himself. A handsome face stared back at him. He smiled. He said, Yes, this really is the mirror of truth. I always knew I was like this. Thank you, Becca. Then something else caught his eyes. On the left-hand corner, there was a tiny scratch. He frowned. Becca, my favorite mirror had a scratch. Just like this. How was it possible that even this mirror? He could not complete his sentence as Becca's laugh drowned his voice. Your Majesty, this is your old favorite mirror only. Then how did it reach here? Well... I hid it in the bushes yesterday. King Rudolph looked at Becca. He didn't know whether to laugh or get angry. Then, there is no such thing as the mirror of truth? He asked Becca. In fact, your majesty, all mirrors are mirrors of truth. And all mirrors now will show you the same reflection as the one you're holding. King Rudolph understood the truth. Hugging Becca, he said, You deserve a special reward for your cleverness. Ask and it shall be granted. Becca thought for a while and then said, A walk with your majesty to the hills at dawn daily and for as long as we both live. Granted, King Rudolph said, the twinkle was back in his eyes. Adapted from a Stephen Southwold story from 40 More Tales.
The Pied Piper of Hamelin Long, long ago, on the banks of the river Weser in Germany, lay a little town called Hamelin. The people of Hamelin were happy and content. Most of them were farmers or fishermen. They earned their livelihood by working very hard on their farms and fishing in the many little streams. As the years went by, the people became rich and prosperous. Suddenly, one day, their peace was shattered. The entire town was invaded by rats. At first, the cats of Hamlin had a party. But soon they got tired. The rats were multiplying too fast. Even the cats ran away to hide from the army of rats. The rats attacked the barns and storehouses. They gnawed at the wood. They gnawed at clothes. They gnawed at everything that came in their way. They even bit babies in their cribs. The citizens could bear it no longer. They approached the mayor of Hamlin. As the town councillors and the mayor were thinking of a plan to get rid of the rats, there was a loud knock at the door. Who can that be? They wondered. As they opened the door, they saw a tall, thin man dressed in brightly colored clothes. He had a blue feather in his tall red hat. He was carrying a golden pipe. Sirs, I have freed other towns of beetles and bats. I can rid your town of rats. I'll charge a thousand florins for this. A thousand florins? We'll give you fifty thousand if you succeed, exclaimed the mayor. The very next day, at dawn, the piper took out his pipe and began to play soft magical music. As he made his way through the lanes of Hamlin, playing on his flute, rats began scampering out from nooks and crannies, cellars and basements, gutters and pipes. There were big rats and little rats, brown rats and black rats, fat rats and thin rats. They all followed him as if it were a military parade. The piper led them away from the town till he reached the river. He continued to play as he stepped into the river and the rats followed him. By the time the piper reached the middle of the river, all the rats had drowned and been swept away by the current. The town of Hamlin was at last free of rats. The people were happy and relaxed. When the piper went to collect his reward, the mayor refused to pay him 50,000 florins. The rats are all dead now and they can never come back. So either take 50 florins or nothing at all. The piper was very angry. Pointing a finger at the mayor, he said, You will regret that you broke your promise, sir. Saying this, the piper disappeared. At dawn, the next day, the piper wound his way through the streets of Hamlin again, playing a different tune this time. All the children came out of their homes and flocked around him. He led them out of the town through a forest till they reached the foot of a huge mountain.
The piper played another tune and a door opened. There was a huge cave inside. The children followed the piper into the cave. When the last child had entered the mountain cave, the door shut and a large boulder rolled down to block the entrance to the cave forever. Only one lame boy was left behind. He returned to Hamlin and told the citizens what had happened. The mayor and all the other citizens of Hamlin never ever broke their promise again. The Golden Touch, a Greek folk tale. Long, long ago, in the ancient land of Greece, there lived a king called Midas. He was a fair and just king, and he ruled his kingdom wisely. The people were prosperous and content. Now, the king had one little daughter called Marigold whom he loved dearly. Princess Marigold did not have a mother and she too loved her father more than anybody else in the world. One day, as King Midas was returning after doing a survey of his kingdom, he found Silenus wandering alone, close to the border. Silenus was God Dionysus' best friend. The king brought him to his palace and treated him as a royal guest. When Dionysus realized that his friend was missing, he set out to look for him. He was overjoyed to see Silenus being treated so well. I must repay your kindness to my friend, he said, thanking King Midas. I shall grant you a wish. King Midas's face lit up with excitement. A wish? He gasped. Whatever I like? Whatever you like, beamed the grateful Dionysus. Midas thought hard. Trembling with excitement, he said, Let whatever I touch turn to beautiful yellow gold. Are you sure? Dionysus was amused. Think again, you may regret it. I am prepared to take the risk, said the king firmly. Then it's done. From sunrise tomorrow morning, your slightest touch will turn everything into gold. But don't say I didn't warn you, Dionysus warned as he left with Silenus. Midas was very excited. He could barely sleep that night. He kept wondering if Dionysus promise would come true. At the break of day, he jumped out of bed. The moment his feet touched the floor, it turned to gold. Gingerly, he touched his bed, his pillow, the couch, and like magic, everything turned into beautiful yellow gold. The king's heart began to race. He rushed out of the palace straight to his garden. He stopped to pick up a flower. And lo, he was holding a golden bloom in his hand. King Midas ran round the garden, touching everything he could see. The pebbles, the bushes, the fountain, even the fountain frozen to a golden spray. The excitement was too much to handle. He soon realized that he had not had a drop of water since morning. Hurrying back into his palace, he announced, Let's have a feast to celebrate my new fortune. But what was happening? The moment he raised a glass of clear cold water to his lips, it became solid gold. The bread turned into gold. The juicy red apple 
became hard and shiny and yellow. The biscuit, the tea, the cake, all was gold, gold, gold. He pushed back his golden chair in dismay. I'll give everything I have turned into gold for just one sip of cool water and a bite of bread. Oh, what have I done? How foolish I've been! He ground while pacing up and down the huge dining hall. Just then, his little daughter came running into the room and before he realized it, she was in his arms. Tears streamed down his face as he felt the apple of his eye stiffen into a cold golden statue. He left his palace and his garden. Weeping bitterly, he prayed for Dionysus to appear before him. Miserable Midas threw himself at Dionysus' feet and begged him to undo the magic. Are you sure you no longer wish to have the golden touch? asked Dionysus. No, I have learnt my lesson. I no longer think gold is the greatest thing in the world. King Midas wept and kept on pleading with Dionysus. Finally relenting, Dionysus said, Go and have a bath in the water of the river Pactolus. You will become normal again. Then sprinkle some of that water on everything that had transformed into gold. The king rushed to the river and hurriedly had a bath. Filling a pitcher with the water from that river, he sprinkled it on Marigold first. Instantly, she returned to her normal human self and gave him a kiss. The king then went around the palace, sprinkling water on everything he had touched. Then, he and Marigold sat down for a delicious breakfast. Food had never tasted so good before. Robert Bruce and the Spider Many, many years ago, there was a king of Scotland whose name was Robert the Bruce. He was a brave and wise ruler. The people of Scotland were lucky to have a ruler like him because at that time England was at war with Scotland. The King of England wanted to capture Scotland and make it a part of England. The independence of Scotland was in danger. Robert the Bruce had a small army of Scottish soldiers. They fought six battles with England but lost each time. The English army was much bigger and stronger. They also had more resources with them. When King Bruce and his army lost the sixth battle, they were driven out of their own country. The entire army of Scotland got scattered. The king became a refugee in his own country. He had to hide in the forests and caves because if the English army caught him, he would be imprisoned. One day, when he was lying down on the rocky bed of a cave, hungry and tired, he noticed a spider getting ready to spin a web. He watched her fascinated as she worked slowly and with great care. Holding her thread Gently, yet firmly, she tried to reach the other end of the cave ball, but she slipped and fell. This did not stop her. She climbed up the cave wall 
and started the process all over again. Six times she tried and six times she failed. King Bruce was amazed. This tiny creature kept on trying again and again and again. Robert thought to himself, There is a lot of similarity between the spider and me. I also tried to fight the English army six times and failed just like the spider. While these thoughts were going on in his mind, the tiny spider crawled up the wall and began the process all over again. Robert the Bruce carefully watched the spider try for the seventh time. He forgot about his own troubles. Would the spider succeed this time? Or would she fail again? Slowly and carefully, the spider held her thread and managed to reach the other end of the cave wall. Yes! She did succeed in the seventh attempt. King Bruce was filled with new hope and courage. He thought to himself, let me try one more time. I just might win, who knows. Robert the Bruce gathered his scattered army together. He recounted the story of the spider and gave them new hope and inspiration. Slowly and carefully, he built an army of brave Scotsmen. A seventh battle was fought and this time, they managed to defeat the English army. The King of England was forced to go back to his own country. England finally recognized Scotland as an independent country and Robert the Bruce as its rightful king. Robert the Bruce became the king of Scotland. But he never forgot the lesson he learned from the tiny little spider. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. <laughs>